Uh, good morning, colleagues. Welcome to Aberdeen and the second meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. We're delighted to be in Aberdeen here this morning, and I'd like to thank Aberdeen City Council in particular for hosting today's meeting. Now, the first item on our agenda today is to continue the Committee's examination of the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19. And our workshop sessions this morning sought to explore the impact of Brexit on the government's spending decision in local communities, but it was also a real opportunity for people from the North East to tell us the issues that matter to them in regard to not just Brexit and the Scottish Budget, but wider matters are concerned as well. We, considered, we covered a significant amount of ground this morning with some great feedback. I guess the one theme that came through to me in regard to all of the sessions I was able to attend was the issue of having more local control over decision and local spending. And that seemed to be a theme in almost all the tables I certainly was able to take part on. Now, we had an MSP representative at each of the five groups who, of workshops this morning, um, and, and MSPs will be able to obviously contribute to this, the discussion. And I want to just go now to the individual MSPs who were at each table to have some feedback from them on the issues that were raised at the working groups they were in involved with. So I'm going to begin with table number one, and Willie Coffey is going to provide the feedback in that regard. Willie, over to you. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, I'd like to share with the committee some of the thoughts of the contributors around our table. As you might imagine, we started off uh, talking about fishing. Uh, Stephen Patterson from Peterhead Port Authority was telling us that there's been basically 10 years of, of, of steady growth uh, in the industry. Something like £200 million of the value, which has doubled in the last 10 years, is what he told us. And of course, they're the biggest processor in the UK now up here, with supporting about 6,000 odd jobs. Um, they very much rely on foreign labour, as you might imagine, in the processing sector. Uh, and the salaries are pretty good in the sector, so if they had any concerns at all, it would probably be shared by colleagues around the table about continuing and sustaining employment in the sector. They are, they, they are investing in a training programme to try to attract more younger people in the North East to take an, interest, an interest back in the in the sector. So there's some good good work going on in that that whole area. Of course, they also mentioned the, the potential impact on access to the fishing grounds post-Brexit and what that might mean. Uh, but they, were, they were concerned that, that if, if anything were to happen that were to upset the balance that we've achieved over a number of years in terms of fishing and, and volumes and quotas and so on, that, that would be a concern if that careful balance was disrupted. Um, Susan Cool from NHS Grampian contributed to that part of the discussion um, about access and staff, they have a particular problem, as you might imagine, in the North, sea, the, the North East about recruitment, and she particularly mentioned into the nursing sector, where costs uh, and property costs, for example, are higher here, but wages tend to be the same throughout the NHS. So uh, Susan was telling us they found a difficulty recruiting there, and interestingly, she remarked that they had been successful in actually recruiting some staff from, from the oil and gas sector, and interestingly, to come into the NHS. Not always entirely successfully, she mentioned, but th there was certainly an opportunity there for her to do so. Um, Dave Black, from the Grampian Racial Equality, he, he was telling us that there's actually been a 34% decrease in national insurance registrations in this area, mainly from people coming from Poland and R Romania. Uh, and whether that then will go on to have a, a negative impact in the local economies at the moment remains to be seen. There didn't appear to be a direct and immediate impact on that, but it's something that they, they're keeping an eye on, that there might be an impact on that. Um, Joyce Duncan from the CVO gave us some really useful feedback. She said the value of the third sector in this area, in Aberdeen City, it's about 350 million pounds worth of value, supporting 10,000 staff and, incredibly, 70,000 volunteers, 25% of whom are European, to, to work in the voluntary sector uh, in this area, which was quite an astounding figure, I think, that she shared 
with us and, and I've, I've written down exactly what she said there. The, she feels as though they're sitting on the edge of a precipice. That Adam will remember her, her saying that to us, which was quite a, quite a concern for her. Um, in common with many other groups, they would be looking for more multi-year commissions rather than the annual, annual commissioning that, that we see in the third sector. And, and we discussed whether there might be an ongoing message for us there in our budgeting process to perhaps move away from single year to three year processes and so on. So that, that would be very helpful, that particular sector and the, the voluntary side of things. Um, back to the oil and gas. We, we spoke briefly about the impact on the oil and gas sector. Uh, the best thing that I think Jamie Coventry from Aberdeen City Council said is possibly stabilising the impact on the sector is probably, while well, not upturning, it's probably stabilising now, but they didn't anticipate any huge impact in the industry coming from, from Brexit per se. Uh, he did point us towards the work that's being done in, in Norway in terms of decommissioning their yards, and they seem to be a wee bit ahead of us in that technology and their development and application of that particular side of their technology. Um, where else could we have a look? We talked about city deals. We had a wee chat about city deals, and it was interesting to me to hear that some of the hopes and aspirations of local people around about the city deals concept, they're kind of shared with even my area of Scotland. It's similar kind of components uh, to, to what we would be looking at in the so focusing on life sciences, tourism, food and drink, and that seems to be shared now in the, in the North East, which came as a wee bit more of a surprise to me. And perhaps I would be expecting maybe more of a focus on the fishing sector and perhaps even a residual focus on the oil and gas sector to um, tourism. There's about 20,000 people employed in, in tourism within Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. And we had a little bit of discussion about the impact on hotel business, hotel occupancy rates and so on, Bruce. Uh, it's down a wee bit. But I know from listening to one of the other contributors at another table that they're quite happy with some of the level of occupancy that is going on, in the, particularly in the city at the moment. So there's maybe a wee bit of a mixed message there for me in picking that up, and perhaps others have got a more concise message to share. Um, we then turned our attention to tax, and whether there was any, anything to be said at the moment for the impact of the land and buildings transaction tax and income tax on what's happening within the, the local economy. It would probably be fair to say it was, it was inconclusive I think, Adam, when we were trying to find out if there was a, if people were making decisions based on the land and building transaction tax impact, or whether it was really an impact from the oil and gas sector that has, has the greatest effect in the, the higher value properties there. Um, on GDP, we were saying we were asking what can we do, what can the government, both governments, do to help uh, the local economy to develop, and of course we we mentioned. Uh, the stability of population or the ability to, to grow the population was absolutely crucial. And one, one of the figures that, that came was quite stark that one of the contributors said that 39% of babies born in this area come from non UK mothers. I hope I've got that right, Adam, if you take a. I know that was quite an astounding figure to, to realise that. But most of the people that are living are now second generation. Europeans and see themselves as, as, as new Scots, if we want to, to use that terminology. Um, turning to my last set of notes, what would you ask? What would you be asking the Cabinet Secretary later today, or what would you like us to ask on your behalf? Joyce uh, was asking, what kind of percentage of funding does the Scottish Government push in towards the whole early intervention side of things rather than the acute side of what we do and what we deliver and to try to achieve more of, that, of a balance there? Um, one of the other contributors said, we need, we need a sense of security. People in the area need a sense of security, to, security and to feel part of this community. There's, there's a, an amount of uncertainty and unsureness about the future and what the, the future might hold. Um, please also recognise the huge opportunity that, that, that still remains in fishing. The industry has been with us for three, four hundred years and possibly, probably longer, and there are huge opportunities there, but we've got to get the balance right. We mustn't, post-Brexit, upset the industry in such a way that it actually causes damage to the sector, ultimately. And lastly, the comment that we had was, please do what you can to protect businesses. 
there is no real connection between the value of a property that a business operates in through the business rating scheme and the actual value that is within the business. So it would be useful if the Cabinet Secretary were able to, to recognise something in that area too. And lastly, in oil and gas, please maximise the economic recovery potential that we have here and, and get as much as we can out of the industry for the, the next generation that we expect it to be with us. For that, that for comprehensive summary. feedback, really, it was very useful. Adam, do you want to add anything to that before we move on? The, the, the one thing that struck me, Kavina, um, that the, the, um, Willie alluded to, but was actually very, very strongly put by um, a couple of people at our table, was that um, in contrast with economies such as the German economy, um, it, it, in the UK we don't support SMEs and, and anything like robustly enough. And there was a, there was a big plea um, uh, for us to um, think about um, uh, small business and medium-sized business it, it, much more than we do, uh, and, uh, and, and particularly in terms of, uh, of, of banking and banking arrangements, which is a, quite, quite a strong theme. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, James, do you want to feed back from your workshop too? Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, we had a, a very helpful and a very informative discussion. We had representatives from oil and gas, uh, culture, transport, uh, uh, aviation and fisheries, and it was uh, ably uh, facilitated by my colleague Patrick Harvey. There were four uh, key strands that came out of the discussion. Uh, first of all, in terms of opportunities and also threats of Brexit, um, it was felt that um, fisheries was a, a potential opportunity, particularly the opportunity to grow the, current, the, the, the way the market is currently 40% um, of uh, fish is, is sourced at home and 60% uh, goes to the EU and felt it was an opportunity to, to reconfigure that and to grow the home end of the market. In order to meet that opportunity, there was a need to address uh, some challenges, particularly around uh, skills and also uh, greater automation. Um, however, some of the members of the group that were um, very concerned about the, not just some of these challenges, but the whole uncertainty that Brexit uh, had created and the potential negative impact that that was starting to have uh, in the North East and was going to continue to have, uh, particularly uh, with a lack of clarity around the, the type of Brexit and the actual plan around Brexit, and I'll say more about that uh, in a minute. Um, I mean, as an example of that, uh, the second area that we looked at was funding, and there were some good examples from around the group uh, in terms of you know practical uh, funding that was in place, uh, for example, in the transport sector for hydrogen buses, and also in the culture sector for local festivals, which uh, some of which attract 30% EU gap uh, EU uh, grant funding, and there's no clarity going forward as to uh, what, uh, how the gap in these f the funding for these uh, schemes would, would, would be addressed. So that was a, a concern around the group, both in terms of local industry and also the, the community. We moved on to discuss the, the shape of the Brexit that people would like to see, and I think the key message that came across is that people are looking for minimum change. They, they want to have access to the markets that they currently have access to. They want to see, uh, they don't want to see a lot of change to trade rules or new barriers uh, introduced. And there's a key uh, factor in ensuring that we st still have uh, access to the EU labour market. Um, the final kind of part of the discussion, you know, starting to kind of pull it together, was to look at. You know, what are the key implications of Brexit locally in the North East and what are the, the actions that are – what are the – what was the discussion group looking for from politicians and governments? Um, I think one of the key th themes that came out across the discussion was the, the skills sh shortage, uh, particularly at the, the lower skilled part of the economy. Um, and there was a feeling that that was, and there were examples given of how that was filled by, uh, you know, uh, by, by EU nationals. 
and there's a real concern that uh, the Brexit may mean that we're, you know, we lose we lose some of that sort of skills base. There, there was also a recognition that there needed to move, be more done in terms of supporting young people getting into employment across uh, all sectors, and the, there were worries and anxieties about the potential impact for you know local housing um, if, if, uh, if Brexit has a detrimental uh, impact to some people in the group were saying uh, on the local economy in terms of pushing housing costs up and how that would affect not just young people but people across the board. Um, the other issue that came across really strongly was the need for a greater recognition of uh, you know, local government here in the North East and, and local solutions. Um, particularly, I think there's a frustration that people feel that uh, you know not enough of the money that's raised in taxation locally comes back to the North East. So the, there needs to be, you know, uh, is in order to try and mitigate the potential negative aspects of a Brexit, there needs to be more local funding and local solutions coming to local government. <clears throat> I think the overall message from the group in terms of what they were looking for is there's a real frustration about the uncertainty around Brexit. Uh, people aren't clear what the UK government and also the Scottish government uh, are doing to address that. And what they want is, is more clarity and they want to see actual, actually practical action. So they want to see across sectors um, government ministers, including the Scottish government ministers, engaging, uh, you know, uh, on a on a one-to-one -one level with uh, key players in the sector, assessing what the issues are around Brexit and beginning to establish solutions. Because I think the key thing that came across as was that the uncertainty and the unknown is creating a lot of anxiety here in the North East. Thank you very much for that comprehensive feedback, James. Patrick, would you like to add anything to, to that? Uh, no, convener. I think just to emphasise that that last point, the the expectation uh, that I think many of the, the the people in our group had was that the discussions that we've had today need to not fall into a vacuum. It needs to be taken on both in terms of Parliament and government engaging with different sectors about the the, the, the need for planning despite the uncertainty, but also for for people who've who've had that discussion and, and perhaps discussed these issues amongst. Uh, each other w with each other for the first time, that opportunity for the discussion to take place, not waiting for politics, politicians, and government, but uh, w within the, the organisations and individuals affected as well. So, it's about where those arguments go from here. Uh, that, that came out very strongly. I think that, that final point that James made. Thank you, Patrick. And now we move to uh, workshop number three. Ivan McKee is going to provide the report back in that regard. Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, myself and um, Murdo Fraser were on a group that had representatives from Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, North East Scotland College, Aberdeen University and Aberdeen City Council. And with a very wide ranging discussion, but w w with that make up, clearly there was a lot of focus on the education and skills sector and how that inter interplayed with, uh, with local business um, in both directions. Um, and clearly, Brexit was the, the, the biggest subject of, uh, of discussion, and there was quite a number of points came out in that regard. There was a bit of discussion about labour shortage and where we will be in terms of um, post-Brexit uh, being unable to access EU labour as easily as at the moment, and then the discussion round about the, the skills gap and the role that colleges are playing, the important role that they are playing in labour inclusion and working um, to bring as, uh, people who um, upskill people who are fullest from the labour market to bring them into the labour market to potentially fill a lot of those, uh, those jobs going forward. There was a lot of discussion around about EU students and the uncertainty there um, in terms of the, the, the huge reliance that uh, the university has in particular um, on, um, on foreign students and EU students, not just um, what uh, they, they bring to the, to the, the university um, 
uh, in terms of being there, spending money in the local economy, but also the fact that it adds hugely to the attractiveness of the university. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to market the university uh, internationally and globally, then it's very important to have that, that breadth of, uh, of students on, on the campus. So the whole uncertainty around about what the funding solutions would be for EU students going forward was, was a big part of the discussion. Uh, we talked about EU workers, and the point was made strongly that it's not just low-skilled jobs, but um, there's many EU workers that, uh, that, that found jobs in the NHS. Um, food and drink sector was, was mentioned. Um, uh, in terms of brewing skills from Germany was one example that came up. Um, so there's a whole range of, of EU workers across, right across the skill spectrum, which is going to be very, um, very much a potentially a risk post-Brexit. And also the point that it's not just a question of the UK government at some point saying um, it's OK for you to stay. Um, that's a two-way street. And if the EU workers are presently here or people are planning to come and bring those skills, get the wrong signals, then they could potentially vote with their feet. Um, and, and we need to understand that, that those skilled people have got options as to where else they would, they would go. I'm going back and talking about universities in relation to research. There was a, a very big fear that the, um, the partnerships that university has across Europe um, could be severely disrupted with, uh, again, people not wanting to come here and do research, but making it more difficult to cooperate with other institutions across Europe. And again, the impact that that has on business, because then you start to see an impact where people don't want to come here for conferences or visits, and that has an impact on the hospitality sector, etc. A um, lot of uncertainty around about funding streams going forward, structural funding, um, and also EU student funding, which we mentioned already. And lastly, on the Brexit um, discussion, there was some, um, some discussion around about um, trade links and the potential for um, Scottish Government agencies, SDI, for example, to um, work not just to sell uh, Scotland as a place to do business, but to be more focused on what's happening locally in the North East, working with organisations here. So when they're making links internationally, um, they're able to connect back into to local organisations in the North East and, and maximise that, that leverage. And that obviously important post-Brexit in terms of protecting foreign direct investment that's already here, um, but also expanding trade into non-EU non countries and how that would play and what work needs to be done to, 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 to protect and move that forward. The second um, big area that we talked about was around about um, local issues, so particularly local control, and there was, there was feeling that um, it would be beneficial if, um, if there was more local control on rates. Um, tourist tax was also mentioned, and being able to have the full virtuous circle there, if you like, of taking decisions locally on, on, on that taxation, the money staying locally and then being used to drive the economy locally, um, which we, that local control was felt quite, quite strongly. And there was also quite a bit of discussion around about um, different pots of money coming into different organisations in, in the North East and perhaps the need for better coordination between the organisations in North East as to how best to focus that money. Um, to, to, to get the, the, the benefit and, and build the, the concept of the place um, and make sure everything was linked up and joined up. And that, again, fed back into the, the, the university discussion we had earlier around about how do you make, um, you make, make the place more attractive for people that want to come and, uh, and, and, study, and study here. Um, and there was some discussion about how the city deals had been structured and the, 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 the projects that were included within that and whether or not that was maximised to deliver what it was felt was um, what, what, what was essential to, 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 to generate the, 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 the biggest benefit for the area. And the final point where there was some discussion um, from the, the Chamber of Commerce in particular around about rates um, and uh, a message came through quite strongly that they would, uh, understanding the budget process is going through discussion and the draft budget isn't the final budget, and they were, they were very keen to make the point that the existing reliefs that were in place were, were protected through that, that process, but also strongly made the point that there were issues around about um, manufacturing and particular fish, fish processing businesses was given as an example where, um, where, where rates could be, uh, could be an issue and there was some concern about um, some of those businesses could relocate if that was seen to be problematic. So I think that's all I've got, and I don't know if... Right, thank you, Ivan. Um, would you like to add anything, Murder? Um, 
Th thank you, Convener. I, I think that's a very fair summary by um, Ivan McKee of the issues. If we maybe just add, add a couple of things for, from my perspective. One thing we did talk about in relation to uh, the post-Brexit scenario was the uh, ability for um, Scottish businesses in particular to extend their reach internationally and whether uh, there's the infrastructure there for them to do that and a bit of a sense that more work needs to be done um, around uh, that area um, in particular. And on the, on the local agenda, I was very struck with, with the degree of consensus there was around this idea that uh, we could see more power devolved locally and uh, things like you know, the um, enterprise spend, the skills spend, even aspects of welfare spend could be controlled locally in a more joined up manner and balanced with more uh, tax uh, collecting powers and tax varying powers at the local level. And it's clear there's quite a lot of ambition around that in the, in the North East. Thank you. Murdo, um, now we need to workshop four. Emma Harper will provide the report back for that. Thank you. Um, our table, uh, Alexander Burnett and I, we had a uh, member from the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, National Farmers Union in Scotland, the Presbytery of Aberdeen and uh, Aberdeen University. We followed the themes for discussion under the, you know, the sectoral impact, employment and labour market opportunities and funding and then community impact. So we pretty much explored each area with each person and one of the emerging issues is um, what is the Scottish Government student's intentions as far as uh, recruiting more Scottish students. So is there going to be a position about engaging um, European students? So right now there's 17.8 per cent of European students at the University of Aberdeen. So is it possible that the, uh, the potential petition in the future, the position in the future could be to widen access so more Scottish students getting into university, inclusive growth, disadvantaged background kids. So, so the ask is to take away any uncertainty, where is the student numbers going to be in the future? We looked at sectoral impact, so as far as uh, fishing, Fraserburgh, Peterborough, Lerwick are the biggest ports. 65% of fish caught by the Scottish fleet. There's only 11% of our fish is caught in European waters. So we have the ability to look at uh, opportunities for, um, certainly for the fishing in the, in the future, as far as negotiating um, how we proceed as far as the common fisheries policy. Um, the ask is for a nine month bridge so that negotiations can proceed. Um, as far as immigration, there's certainly an opportunity for a nuanced immigration policy that would work for students at the universities and indeed that is certainly an ask for the National Farmers Union because of previous seasonal agricultural workers schemes. So the National Farmers Union representative Lorna uh, is interested in the government helping make sure people are aware of where the workforce comes from. Um, dairy farming workforce, there's issues with that abattoirs, fruit and veg, uh, and berry pickers. So it's interesting to explore that the government needs to get more message out about uh, the purpose of subsidies. The farmers do not want subsidies, but uh, they are helping support the industry as we are um, looking at uh, the future. So 360,000 jobs created in farming, and for every one pound invested, there's about five pound thirty comes back into the economy. So there's a huge opportunity for labour and trade and issues around the workforce. Government could do better to promote education for agriculture, even fishing and construction. So there's a call for careers guidance at school level, junior level, to promote opportunities for developing the youth workforce in rural jobs, including fishing. We spoke about an ethical approach to the labour workforce and uh, maybe making an assessment to explore what kind of jobs are actually needed across the farming sector. Um, again, nuanced immigration policy was quite important and uh, proposing that uh, we have money to develop more businesses and smaller businesses from the government. Um, as far as research and innovation, that was 
interesting because our research is international. Many of our teams are international, and that's not just uh, European teams. It's uh, maybe exploring opportunities for research collaboration, so financial support with America as well as China. And um, certainly we need further research and delivery for farming. Um, Blight-free potatoes was brought up, and the need to be better about sharing good research and uh, research and development tax credits maybe could be more enabling. We spoke a little bit about uh, other research as far as um, the electronic data and transfer is pretty sectoral as far as the tagging of livestock so that we can trace better for disease management or livestock <coughs> management. So, um, I guess one of the funding asks was for the Scottish Fisheries Federation to have some proper financial support for stock assessment of fish. So as we leave the EU, that certainly would be something that would be supported and um, good feedback from Marine Scotland or about Marine Scotland. And uh, Norway provides um, money for research, so stock assessment to look at the whole sustainability of it. And additionally, the potential for the Scottish Government to support further investment in manufacturing for local equipment so that our local industry, local farmers, would uh, purchase from within Scotland. Uh, currently, a lot of the equipment comes from Europe. And uh, cultural community impact. So the Presbytery of Aberdeen were very interested in making sure that we maintain our cultural support and engagement with our EU neighbours. And arts and culture requires active investment. It just doesn't happen if you have economic um, improvements or eco economic stability. We actually do need to act actively fund our arts and culture. So um, we want to make sure we maintain our European connections and uh, retain a focus and engagement and openness with our European neighbours. Thank you very much, Emma. Alex, would you like to add in to that? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I think that's been a, a very good summary of what was a very thorough discussion. Thank you, Emma. Um, I think one point, just to repeat and reinforce, uh, was around research and development uh, and how important it is not only to maintain but increase our R&D funding, uh, but also more importantly to look at what barriers uh, there were um, from turning research into business. A, a number of participants uh, talked about how we seem to be very good at doing the research, uh, but not so good at turning it into, businesses, into business ideas locally, and a lot of ideas maybe uh, going abroad, having been researched and uh, developed in Scotland. Um, and so really what opportunities are there for the Scottish Government uh, to encourage uh, such investment? Thank you very much. And lastly, in uh, workshop five, uh, Neil Bibby, you're going to provide the feedback from that. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Uh, myself and Ash Denham met representatives from uh, the higher education, hospitality, tourism uh, and construction sectors, as well as representatives of local government and economic development. Um, we firstly looked at the challenges uh, facing different sectors as a result of Brexit. The um, first point that was made is obviously the North East economy is different from the rest of Scotland due to a focus on oil and gas, but there's a need to support uh, that industry, but you know all other sectors in the in the northeast um, economy. Uh, the first area we looked at was higher education. Um, Brexit was described as potentially a catastrophe, um, and it's been driven by uncertainty affecting the sector. I think the, the, the one of the key points that was made was around reputational uh, damage, um, and international work has already been affected um, by the idea that the UK is. Uh, drawing inwards, and it's not just affecting um, uh, international work across the EU, but in, in, in China and, and the USA as well. And the higher education sector is finding it impossible to have high-level researchers come um, to the area recently, and, and, and Germany is seeing the benefit of this. And it's not just affecting, um, you know, drawing in students, but, but staff as well. Um, and on the issue of migration, it's, you know, universities aren't able to answer the questions uh, that staff and potential students have, um, and I think that's because of that uncertainty. Um, in terms of research, statements have been made by the government on funding, um, but, but, but there's a sense that they're still not fully aware of the picture um, uh, going, going forward. Um, on, on energy, 
Um, again, you know, there's a feeling that companies want to invest in Britain and in Scotland, um, but they won't until they know where they stand. Uh, there has been more positive investment recently in the oil and gas sector, um, as well as an increase in the oil price. Um, but there was also a feeling that you know, um, you know, oil and gas won't last forever, and there's a need to maintain um, strong leadership in the role of a move to a low carbon economy. Um, because of that, on fisheries, uh, need, um, there, there may be a result in increased landings as a result of leaving the EU, but there would be a need for more investment in the processing sector to deal with that. Um, but again, a lot of the, the workers in that sector are. EU nationals. Mm -hmm. uh, tourism, that was an in interesting um, kind of uh, viewpoint from the tourism sector. Uncertainty is a less of an issue for them. In the short term, the weaker pound has resulted in and uh, has stimulated more growth in the tourism sector. Um, but again, labour supply in the hospitality sector um, from EU nationals is absolutely crucial. British Hospitality Association report shows that 62,000 EU nationals are required just to keep the sector ticking over. 80% of staff in one hotel locally are um, non-GB EU nationals. Um, and, and they have also raised concerns that they may struggle to bid for events and conferences if uh, academic strength and industry strength is, is not there. Um, but you know, inbound tourism um, is at an all-time high, and they want to, to maintain that. Uh, in terms of other challenges, rural development programme, EU funding uh, only guaranteed until March 19, and they need certainty on f uh, funding after that. Uh, we then went on to discuss what could be done. Uh, one person thought that the Scottish Government should be doing much more to attract in investment in Scotland. There was a mixed views on the table on that. Uh, some, some thought uh, uh, a lot was being done. Um, uh, but what was agreed was that it was important to, that we do send out the right message um, and that, that, that Scotland and that Britain is open uh, for business. One of, um, another key theme was that thinking has to be long term, um, particularly from the hospitality sector. More than, uh, it has to be more than just one budget to the next year to year. There is uncertainty regarding, um, or has been uncertainty regarding the rates position. Um, with very last-minute decisions, um, and they would like to see a sensible resolution needed to take uh, forward a, a rate structure. Um, also, in terms of long-term thinking, uh, you know, more investment in transport and infrastructure um, was, was, was thought to be key to attracting inward investment as well. Um, funding for EU students. Um, un universities don't know if they will still have uh, a fee-free status for EU nationals. What, what will happen there is a key question they want answered. And if EU student funding is withdrawn, will it be maintained through Scottish uh, students? We then went to discuss the, the labour supply. Uh, there was a, a, a feeling across our group that guarantees needed to be given to EU uh, non-GB nationals um, who are living and working here that they, they can continue to do so. Um, and we need to look at how we can attract uh, a non-GB workforce to, to come here, um, acknowledging the difference of migration needs between Scotland and other parts of the UK. Um, there is a feeling Scotland needs more migration, uh, mm -hmm. and if migration falls, we need to change perceptions about the hospitality sector and possibly the rural economy to attract more um, Scottish workers into those um, industry. Um, and you know, one, one person suggested looking at a um, a, a regional, uh, regionally administered immigration uh, immigration system, um, but there was the general feeling that people needed to feel welcome here, um, and, and, and investment to attract people to come here. Uh, we then looked at opportunities um, as a result of, of Brexit. Um, there was feeling from from one that um, we could see the modernisation of sectors. Uh, that had previously been held back by EU rules, for example, uh, the agricultural structure based on uh, the CAP regime um, that could result in some changes there. Um, and also some EU legislation would be good to avoid uh, was the view of, of uh, the hospitality sector, for example, the package uh, travel directive, uh, which is due to come into force, which despite being, they thought, would, despite being well-meaning, uh, could restrict the innovation of small businesses in the hospitality sector. Um, there was also a feeling there was an opportunity to grow the manufacturing uh, base, particularly if 
uh, without the state aid rules, depending on where that, that is devolved, um, and also more flexibility on regional selective assistance. On tax incentives, uh, there was a feeling that um, there should be tax incentives for start-up businesses that would incentivise people to, to come here, um, uh, particularly to, to visit. Um, on funding, um, it was felt it was important for higher education to uh, to not just you know work with EU institutions, but but uh, and that wasn't just about money; it was also about uh, relationships, um, maintaining those relationships across the EU as well. Um, and it would be uh, there was also a feeling it would be good to know where possible if the UK didn't participate in geographic-based programmes that the Scottish government uh, still still could. On investment, there was a brief discussion on innovation hubs. It was thought that they were a good idea, but it was, it was um, felt that they need to be better known and what they are doing and the benefits to industry. And they also, I believe, that they need to be clearly aligned with opportunities uh, and where do we want to go in the, in the long term um, as well. Uh, and then we discussed at the end community impact. Um, we heard that there was a lot of pressure on the third sector, reliant on European social funding. Um, affected already by public sector funding cuts, um, and also, um, you know, potentially going to be hit by European social funding cuts as well, which account around 40 per cent of project funding, um, and that's going to have a double whammy because potentially there, there could be an increase in demand on employability projects and advice projects provided by third sector organisations as well. So again, you know, the plea to kind of move beyond uh, short term funding and thinking. Um, so that kind of sums it up in keeping with the other, you know, um, the groups. I think the key themes around uncertainty, need for long-term thinking, sending out the right messages, and, and local investment and funding we came across, came across loud and clear. Thank you very much, Neil. Ash Denham, would you like to add anything to that? Um, I would. I think Neil's given a very comprehensive summary there. I'd just like to um, just bring out a couple of things that I felt came across really strongly. Um, one of them was about um, Brexit and the reputational damage aspect of that, the perception that the UK is now um, sort of pulling up the drawbridge. But this negative effect is not just in Europe, it's out with Europe, which was interesting. China and America were mentioned. And so, um, you know, affecting things like students um, and university staff, that it's not just having an effect on the ones that might be coming from Europe, but it's coming, you know, those that potentially could be coming from, from out with the EU, which I thought was interesting. Um, also, um, about infrastructure, there was a plea for increased connectivity on things like um, the digital infrastructure, but also raid, um, roads, rail, and, and so on, um, and particularly that they felt that this part of Scotland maybe was you know, neglected and that that was something that needed to be looked at for the future. And um, we also spoke about what the, the Scottish Government was doing to promote Scotland abroad, particularly with regard to trade and foreign direct investment. And there was a bit of a, a discussion about that, and some people felt that there were plenty of things being done, but then the people who didn't think that were saying, well, you know, more could be done to promote what, what is being done so that more people are aware of what exactly is out there and how they can, with their businesses, they can connect into the, what's available. Thank you very much, Ash Denham. Um, well, thank you for my colleagues for that very comprehensive feedback from this morning's um, works, workshops. I'd like to thank also, again, those who participated in this morning's exercise. I hope they recognise some of the main elements that were discussed during the various workshops. We have obviously gathered a lot of information. We want to put some of that to the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon. Obviously, I will not be able to put it all to him, but it will certainly form part of our report. Um, those who uh, attended the sessions this morning are welcome to come to lunch, and, but also to attend the session this afternoon with the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I now suspend this particular meeting of the the committee and for a very quick lunch because we we'll need to start again at 1.15. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues, um, and welcome back to the Finance and Constitution Committee. The second item on today's agenda is to take evidence on the expenditure proposals in the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19, and from Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution. Um, given, and we also, uh, to remind colleagues, we considered his taxation proposals at our previous meeting. Mr Mackay is joined today by Scottish Government officials Graham Owenson, who is the Head of Local Government Finance, and John Nicholson, who is the Deputy Director for Financial Security, Scrutiny and Outcomes. Thanks, Scott. And Scott Mackay. I'm sorry, Scott. Nobody's... Head of what? Head of Financial Coordination. Head of Financial Coordination. Is that correct, Scott? 
Well, I'm glad you're here to help us coordinate. Thank you. Um, I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement. Thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, if I could just very briefly update uh, Committee on uh, one matter from last week's uh, revenue section. Uh, I will write to the Committee, but it was just to inform uh, members that the issue in relation to marriage uh, relief uh, allowance, HMRC, has uh, confirmed through my officials that that will be uh, uh, resolved. As I say, it was a technical matter, and I've had confirmation through officials that that will be resolved, and I'll write to the committee for your full consideration. Uh, if I can then go on to uh, expenditure, it is a pleasure to be with the committee uh, in Aberdeen uh, to discuss the expenditure plans for the 2018-19. Uh, 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 as I've said uh, previously, it is in a challenging uh, economic and fiscal uh, in environment. Uh, we know that our economic fundamentals remain um, strong, but that we must boost our productivity and grow our working age uh, population. And that's why there are a number of measures to help stimulate and support uh, the economy, including £4 billion of an infrastructure investment, a 64% uplift in the economy, jobs and fair work portfolio, the £150 million uh, building Scotland fund, uh, and doubling investment uh, to £80 million, a range of measures to support Scotland becoming a more active nation. Uh, £50 million will be invested towards a target to phase out the need for new and petrol vehicle cars by 2032, and will also support uh, a low carbon innovation fund to the tune of £60 million. There will be £137 million as part of the commitment to invest more than uh, £500 million over the four years in energy efficiency and heat decarbonisation and, of course, the procurement of a £600 million investment package in our R100 digital programme supported by £21 million from UK Government. Uh, in total, it will be £2.4 billion in our enterprise and skills bodies and the most attractive business rates and non-domestic rates system anywhere uh, in the UK. The draft budget protects our public services and those that deliver them, uh, including a £400 million additional resource investment in the health service, over £200 million above inflation, a 3% pay rise for all those earning less than £30,000, and £243 million of investment for the expansion of early learning and childcare, and £170 million to the Attainment Scotland Fund. Over £20 million will protect the police budget in real terms, and Scotland's police and fire services will retain the full benefit of their ability to recover VAT, boosting their spending power by an additional £35 million. The 2018-19 local government finance settlement, funded through this draft budget, foresees an increase both in revenue and capital investment as part of a wider package of measures. And together with local authorities' ability to increase council tax by 3%, worth around £77 million pounds next year. This will generate a real terms increase in overall resources available for local government services. The draft budget also maintains our support to mitigate the worst effects of the UK Government's welfare reform and deliver fairness for our citizens, including fully mitigating the bedroom tax, establishing a tackling child poverty fund worth £50 million pounds, uh, over the period of the child poverty delivery plan, and the first £10 million pounds of an ending homelessness fund. As the committee will know, individual portfolio ministers have lead responsibility for the planning and delivery of expenditure in their own areas, but these highlight, hopefully, a, an overview of this government's priorities. <clears throat> My Cabinet Secretary colleagues have been given evidence in recent weeks, in some case months, on the spending proposals that each portfolio has uh, set out in the draft budget. And I hope that the evidence they have provided to Parliament gives much of the detail and that this has been helpful. I'm happy to give my own perspective on the strategic direction that drives proposals, where that would be helpful. And I also hope that the committee agrees with the Parliament's Financial Scrutiny Unit that we have been effective at delivering the Budget Process Review Group's recommendation on transparency and accessibility. And finally, Kavina, I wish to put on record again my willingness to engage with all members of Parliament to build support for my tax and spending proposals and I value the contribution that this committee will make in that process through your scrutiny of the Government's plans and your recommendations. I'm sure you're aware that uh, we, this morning we had a, a wide cross-section of people from different organisations and businesses in the North East area who came to give us some evidence on 
the issues of Brexit and also the, the, the Scottish budget. And I'm, I'm acutely aware that today's um, session is primarily focused on the expenditure side of the budget. But I think I, I sh it would be appropriate for me to reflect on one of the key themes that came through on the, on this, in this morning's discussions. And the other themes will be drawn out in our report when we bring it together um, towards the end of the month, which the government will get a chance to respond to in detail. Certainly one of the key themes from this morning was a significant consensus around the need for greater local control, and in particular for greater local control over any taxes generated in the north-east of Scotland, you know, whether that's business rates or any other taxation issues. Now, I know you'll not be able to address that specifically in your budget for this financial year because the draft's already out, but how would you respond for that for the longer term um, about dealing with that desire for more local control, more decisions being made in the North East and local solutions being found? On, on a policy front, there certainly is a desire for uh, more localism and uh, flexibility. In my, uh, for example, the negotiations with uh, uh, local government, they, they have a clear desire for, for increased flexibility nationwide, not just in the North East, and we're trying to respond to that. One of the ways is through the governance review that we're doing in partnership uh, with COSLA, so we're looking at essentially local governance. There is a policy perspective here. There is legislation on community empowerment that I started when uh, I was a local government minister. And there's legislation, I think, there that can be used. There's also power of well-being that's not, not that well used. That's existing uh, legislation, and, and maybe there should be more emphasis around the flexibility that that might get. Um, so that's some of the policy intention, I, I suppose. But I want to tackle a, a major misapprehension, and I know it exists here in Aberdeen. I felt it through the course of the revaluation when I had to make this point. A lot of people don't realise that um, non-domestic rates is retained by each uh, local authority. Council tax is retained by each local authority. Why do I make that what well, seems like an obvious point? Because sometimes people have been told that their money is sent Elsewhere, for example, people in the North or East, for political reasons, have been told that the money was all sent to the central belt. Well, it's not. Council tax and on domestic rates, every penny is ultimately retained by uh, the local authority in which it was uh, derived. In terms of that, that drive for more empowerment and, and more financial flexibility locally, um, there is occasionally a request for, say, a transient visitor levy, a, a, a tax on the hospitality sector, and there's some desire around that. It hasn't been in accordance with um, government policy, but it allows me to make the point that where authorities or local government or others approach Scottish government with a request around greater financial flexibility and ability to raise taxes, we'll, get, we'll engage in it. But it would be helpful if we had evidence and a business case that allows us to consider it more um, fully. So we'll be open-minded on, on these matters. Evidence of greater financial freedom, city and region deals. Uh, the budget for that is doubling in this draft budget from about £60 million to £120 million. So that's get greater uh, financial uh, uh, freedom uh, within that. And as I say, I think there is a sense of community empowerment Community empowerment itself is being supported um, by the uh, community's brief. So I think there's a range of areas in which we are supporting that localism, um, but some of the misunderstandings about local government finance I think I have to um, clarify. Um, but, but certainly I think there's an ongoing debate about who controls what, and that's why we're engaging in a governance review, and we're doing it in partnership with COSLA. Okay, let's get into some of the specifics of the expenditure side of your Budget Cabinet Secretary. And one of the main concerns, I'm sure you'll be aware yourself, that's been raised um, by a, a number of people is regard to the spending allocations and draft budgets being the level of funding for local government. And I just wondered how you would respond to these concerns and how you intend to reflect on them, what you might do about it. I know that um, we touched on this at the, the revenue side, and that I've said, and I said it at the um, a presentation of the draft budget that it was a fair settlement for local government. I know that they were forecasting and planning for worse. This was better, I think, than any council had been planning for. In the negotiations I had with uh, COSLA, um, 
certainly at the meeting they reacted positively and um, they appreciate the efforts around understanding their needs. Now, if you take an example in that, they identified to me their need in relation to social care uh, was around £60 million, and that's why the, the figure to support uh, local authorities in social care is at £66 um, million, pounds, and responding to individual requests for support, say, around p teachers' pay as well, um, was satisfied. You know, local government will always um, ask for more. That is their right, that is their duty. Um, uh, as a council leader, I would have done, indeed, did to do the same. Um, but I think overall the settlement is fair uh, in that it represents and resource um, broadly flat cash and capital uh, an increase. Overall, if councils do choose to use their council tax powers, that would generate £77 million that takes local government into the territory of a real terms uh, increase, of course, using the GDP um, uh, deflator. So I think in recognition of the fiscal challenge that we all face, it is a fair settlement and one of which has been able to respond to many of their concerns. What's more, there's a number of partnership areas that isn't just a local government function or a Scottish government function. For example, early learning and childcare. And we're able to progress our plans on a nursery provision and, and childcare by investment in resource and capital to that effect as well. The full £150 million in capital goes to um, local authorities. Uh, for all those reasons, I think it's a very fair settlement at £10.5 billion, uh, including the resources that I've mentioned. The Secretary have indicated that they want to ask questions in this area through the clerks. So if there's others who I don't take in, please let me know. But I think, Neil Bibby, I think you had a question in this area. I've got a couple, a couple of questions, convenient, if, if I may. Um, according to just on the issue, just to clarify, on, according to space between 2017-18 and 2018-19, there will be a real terms cut to local government of 2% in the general revenue grant and the non-domestic rate income. Is that correct? I'll ask Graham to cover the detail if you want to do line by line. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but uh, certainly if you add in the specific grant line, then it's a flat cash. Specific grant in a, in a minute, but 2% cut in local government, real terms, in the general revenue grant and the non-domestic rate income, 2% um, cut equals £183 million, pounds, excluding the specific grant. Is that correct? That's what, that's, that's what SPICE say. I'm not challenging the SPICE right. thing. Okay. Um, and Mr McKay, you're always on about you know, discretionary spending and concerned about um, you know, your budget being... Uh, cut in terms of discretionary spending. Why then are you cutting discretionary spending for local councils? Well, I, again, I've, what I've been able to explain is that overall the resource reduction to Scotland's budget is down by £211 million. I turn it into growth for Scotland's public services by, um, yes, using our tax uh, powers. Uh, we clearly have set out a budget that um, has investment for the NHS, uh, for education uh, within that um, as well for police and fire and, and other commitments. Um, Recognising that um, local government is a priority, does deliver shared uh, priorities, there is essentially a, a, kind of a flat cash settlement for local government, um, not a reduction uh, in cash, with an increase uh, in capital. Now, as part of that, in terms of discretionary spend and other projects, um, we believe that uh, childcare provision is a joint priority, so it's not unreasonable uh, in giving it an extra allocation to local authorities or for that or for teachers' pay or for the pressures around um, social care that they receive that investment as part of the um, settlement. And that might be one of the, the reasons for point of difference between the SPICE briefing and the numbers that we've given you. I think it's interesting when it comes to discretionary spending, it seems to appear to be one rule for yourself, Mr McKay, and other for Scotland's councils. Um, but even when you include additional money through specific revenue grants, you're saying that that's a flat cash settlement. Spice are saying that that would result in a real terms cut of 1.4%. Would you dispute that? Yeah, I'm not going to argue back and forward about the Spice briefing versus our briefing. The figures I've presented to you is our position as a government. And in that, we are saying that, yes, specific commitments... And that may be a dedicated resources for a dedicated function, but it's one that local government delivers, leads to a cash increase in resource, albeit you know, small, about three or four million pounds, and then more substantial in relation to capital. 
The difference I would make between, for example, a local government and the health service, unless we want to introduce prescription charges which should be determined by the government, local authorities can increase their resource by using their council tax powers. Other parts of the public sector don't have that ability and the resource at which they receive is almost entirely determined by the Scottish Government the decisions we make in the draft budget. Councils in, uh, across Scotland and Aberdeen and Glasgow are bracing themselves for um, significant uh, savings and cuts. Uh, Rem your own council, Renfrewshire, are looking to cut funding for vital support services uh, for vulnerable families, looking to reduce bin collections, potentially increase parking charges, day centres are at risk. It, isn't it the case that excluding health the majority of services to the public are provided through local government. And then why is there then a real terms cut to local government budgets? And you have said that this is a budget for public services. How can it be a budget for public services if it is a budget that is cutting in real terms local government budgets? Broadly speaking, uh, local government accounts for about a third of public sector expenditure, the NHS another third and everything else a third. So yes, it is a major um, delivery vehicle for public uh, services. I have made the point that if local authorities use their council tax uh, power, they can deliver a real terms increase for their uh, budget. Uh, I would uh, make the point uh, that a lot of local authorities do scenario planning and budget preparations and many put in the public domain what savings may look like. And then they get the settlement numbers and reconsider the savings options that they have put in the public domain. And There is always a difference between the savings options that is put in the public domain and what is actually decided and delivered by local authority councillors. Having a settlement that was better than they forecast um, and I'm not saying suddenly we've entered the land of milk and honey for local government. Far from it. There are challenges. I've recognised that before. But what they are preparing for is better than what they might have uh, been forecasting uh, for and presented savings options for. So local government is an important part of the public sector uh, family. And I do believe it's a fair, a fair settlement in the challenging fiscal circumstances that we face. Uh, but that said, I, I, you know, I know this is questions to the Cabinet Secretary, but if not you know, investing in the health service, why is that? Why shouldn't that be a priority? Why shouldn't investing in higher further education be a priority as well as investing uh, in uh, local government services? And within that, of course, there are um, ring fenced funds for attainment uh, as part of the overall settlement, which is you know, delivered by local authorities. You, you've, um, you, you've described it as a fair settlement this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I think in the press you, you described it as a very fair settlement. Um, but according to SPICE, between 2010-11 and 2017-18, local government revenue budget fell, has fallen by 8.5% when the Scottish government fell, uh, budget fell by only 5.9%. How, how can you say that local government has been treated fairly when you have disproportionately been cutting local government budgets more than your own budgets? And how can you suggest it is a fair settlement when you are actually cutting it in real terms? As I've now pointed out on a few occasions, now we can argue whether I think it's a fair settlement or a very fair settlement. You can choose uh, as a committee what uh, term you prefer. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, say in response to the question, over a period uh, of time, it was uh, possible to protect uh, local government. Now, just from memory, um, the overall reduction in comparison to local government in Scotland versus south of the border, about fourfold. I think the reductions in England are about 20 odd percent uh, in real terms. Because local authorities have that ability to be able to raise uh, council tax, then that of course can supplement their income to provide um, uh, uh, services and that has to be borne uh, in mind. There are pressures on other parts of the public sector, including the NHS. There are commitments, of course, to ensure that the NHS is funding. As I've pointed out, it has a large call on our resources. We discuss that over elections. It's a priority for the public as well. And I'm sure Mr Bibby is not disputing the need to invest uh, above inflation resources in the National Health Service at this point in time. In relation to local government, as I say, the, the two settlements uh, that I have uh, proposed to, to oversee uh, so far um, have ensured that local government got a, a fair settlement and this year if they use the council tax powers will um, be in the terms of real terms uh, increase in resource. I think in the circumstances um, that is a good outcome for local government.
Can, can I just one government deal? But there's, there's other want to ask questions in that area. So let me get some others in in that issue, and I'll come back to you on, before we move on to other areas. But I think Willie Coffey wanted to ask some questions, as did Patrick. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned the figure in your remarks here, of £10.5 billion for local government, but in referring to the spice paper I also have in front of me, it tells us that when you add in the other sources of support to deliver local services, this actually climbs to £11.3 billion. Now, some colleagues are like to omit some of this investment that is taking place within local government because it is not directly in the initial allocation, but there are substantial extra funding made available to support local services, and when you add all this up, it comes to about £11.3 billion and not the 10.5 that you had mentioned. Is that a figure that you can confirm or clarify for us, please? I don't have that spice paper in front of me. What, I, mean, I obviously attend uh, local government committee as well, and what I've described to local government uh, committee is that there is the, um, the, the revenues that are proposed in the, the grant settlement, the non-domestic rates, well. And then there are funds that come from portfolios that go through local government as well. So there's a range of funding streams that do reach local government, especially when they're joint priorities. Um, but uh, contextualising it, again, I've said that the settlement is broadly the same with an increase in capital. But even on capital, we have to take into account the massive investment in housing, which is largely done through local government and RSLs, uh, or city deal or regional deal um, arrangements as well. Uh, housing's up, you know, to about seven hundred odd million pounds to achieve the target of fifty thousand affordable homes, and city deals has, has, has doubled essentially city and region deals, uh, and they are uh, negotiated with local government as key partners. So there's a range of funding streams uh, beyond core settlement that reaches local government. Now, sometimes there's again a misunderstanding, and I, I get the point. Uh, a view around. Um, other pressures on local government. That's why sometimes there's a difference in the figure between what local government uh, receives from Scottish government overall uh, and the overall pressures that they might face. And that's why sometimes the, the figures are, are different and interpreted as a Scottish government reduction to uh, local government when, in fact, it's extra pressures that they may well face. But it's not a reduction in grant from Scottish government. Uh, thank you very much. If I can. Uh paraphrase your response, Cabinet Secretary, to the UK budget. Uh, you said that the extra uh, capital money and financial transactions uh, was welcome, meaning you would try and do good things with it, but that it was important to remember it couldn't pay for public services. It wasn't revenue funding. Doesn't local government have a right to make the same argument? Because whichever way you count, uh, the, uh, the, the, the grant to local government, whether it's just the general revenue grant or including all of the other uh, funds that are available, all the various ways of, of counting that produce significantly bigger revenue cuts than the 77 million you point to as the ability to raise extra council tax. So that council tax, even if they all raise by 3%, cannot make up the cut in the funding that can provide public services at local government level. So isn't it clear that unless you change your position on the draft budget, the inevitable consequence is cuts to public services at council level? A, local government will have choices to make about what it chooses to invest in. I would just make the point that adding those, what I think are partnership priorities, takes you to position of a cash increase in resource. It's not a real terms increase. I recognise that point. It's a cash increase. Um, and I make the point that local authorities uh, can use their tax powers to take it into resource terms, a uh, increase for frontline um, uh, services. And as I say, uh, capital is separate. But Patrick Harvey makes the point about resource. And I can't be clear. I accept that it's about flat cash in terms of resource. Uh, and if uh, councils use their powers, then it can take it into real terms growth by that achieving £77 million. Pounds. Three figures that we've got from the SPICE briefing, depending on, on which uh, grants we count, uh, are a £183 million pound cut, or a £135 million pound cut, uh, or a £157 million pound cut. None of those can be made up with £77 million, pounds, can they? Uh, well, not in those figures, no. Not in those figures. But what I would want to understand more fully is what are the 
elements of that that are discounted by SPICE as new resource that we would include to get to that flat cash figure. What is the reason, what is the policy objective that the government has for, you know, we, we, we've got a, a table in the, the SPICE briefing as well showing where the areas of Scottish government expenditure that are going up in real terms and the areas that are going down. Local government is consistently in the bottom half of that that chart showing consistent cuts. What is the policy objective the Scottish Government has of consistently placing local government at that low priority? With clearly limited resources, and we are making a decision to use our tax powers, we have um, priorities and service needs to consider, and the main one clearly is the National Health Service. And we've made it clear that investment is required in the NHS uh, and it is reflected in our spending plans to invest over four hundred million pounds more in the National Health Service. Yes, um, government is about cho choices and priorities, but I believe that we've been able to protect local government, uh, recognising that it has revenue raising ability as well. There are many, as I say again, many partnership areas in which local government delivers them and Scottish Government is investing in them, for example in capital and housing a massive increase uh, in that. I think it suggests that uh, council, uh, we trust councils to deliver housing and we want to invest in housing. So it's an example of a massive increase in resource to be able to achieve uh, that target. So I think we have been able to show that there are priorities delivered by local government that the government supports. Education is another example. Tackling the attainment gap uh, uh, clear and you know, some uh, colleagues might object to ring fencing, but I think it's been necessary and its worth has been proven in allocating that resource to local government, but in a ring fence fashion. Changes in the draft budget. Out of about 25 headings, local government is the third last. That's the third biggest cut. Is that a fair reflection of the Scottish Government's priorities? Local government is um, uh, receiving a fair deal and has done uh, by this government. If, if, you, if, if, that's, if your question has not already been captured, then I'll move on to another area. So I just, um, just to um, finish off, um, I, I don't think the settlement is either fair or very fair. Cabinet Secretary, I think it's a dreadful uh, settlement, but um, and I don't think COSLA even accept it's a cash flat um, settlement either. But um, surely a fair settlement would be taken on cognizance of what COSLA have said about the increasing demands and the increasing costs that are being placed on councils. Demand isn't static. COSLA have said that they, would, they need an additional £545 million just to stand still with that increasing demands, those increasing pressures, those increasing costs. So I just want to ask you, you know, we've, we've dealt with obviously the, the cuts, the real terms cuts that are there, but why have you also ignored the plea for additional funding for local government in COSLA, specifically the £545 million. Do you think they're wrong when they're asking for £545 million just to stand still? No, I think they're right, and I'll quote the evidence they gave to your committee when they said, I don't think we're calling for an extra £500 million explicitly, so even COSLA seem to have told you. Uh, sorry, local government committee, I do apologise. See, I look at every committee, not just the finance committee, um, and they, even COSLA is not seriously arguing for that kind of figure. That's just a matter of public record and matter of fact. That's in the public domain. Uh, as part of those negotiations, I know that local government is more realistic and constructive, and that's what they've said as a consequence of those negotiations. They, they, they play in the real world. They negotiate what their actual pressures are, and we come to a, a settlement. I now write to 32 out of 32 local authorities and ask them if they'll accept this uh, offer uh, or not. I, make the point that it's also a no-sanction or a sanction-free budget um, as well. So um, engagement is constructive. And I just say again, what COSLA said to local government committee is even COSLA is not asking for that figure that Neil Bibby has just referenced. In the course of that discussion, we've obviously heard about the government's priorities around the health service and expenditure. And given that's the biggest expenditure area, perhaps we should go there next. And Ivan McKee, I think, had... Some um, <coughs> thanks, Convener. Yeah, I'd like to uh, touch on the health budget and then also um, talk around about the outcomes in the national performance framework, so two parts to this. First of all, in terms of the, the health budget, I mean, looking at the numbers, um, in 1819, 
There's a real terms increase, 175 million, 1.3 per cent, and a cash increase of 373 million, 2.8 per cent, which is obviously to be welcomed. I really just want to look at that over the, 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 the two years so far in this Parliament and looking forward um, to consider uh, where we go over the, the, the lifetime of this whole Parliament um, in terms of manifesto commitments. So the numbers I can see in cash terms, there's been a 740 million increase um, and there's a 2 billion commitment over the five years of the Parliament. And in real terms, there's a, as we know, a 500 million um, increased commitment um, to the, the health budget and so far in the first two years is up by 370 million which is obviously um, a significant way down that road um, I don't know if you want to comment on where we're up to so far in two years into the five years on the manifesto commitment for the term of the parliament and where you think that's going and if you see that manifesto commitment as being, being secure I think it would be best just to uh, repeat what the Health Secretary has said, that she believes and her officials believe that that financial commitment is on track to be truly judged by the end of the parliamentary term in its true sense, but it's on track in that above uh, inflation uh, increases have been given and we have passed on Barnet consequentials, including uh, in quite difficult circumstances. I mean, it's yeah. Can, can, I, can, can I come back to that, Ivan? Is that okay? Just so I need to just get a, 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 a broader spread of voices at this stage from different perspectives. And in that case, I'm going to come to Adam on issues to do with, I think, social security and equalities. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> um, I just want to try and understand how the numbers in the budget document r relate to the, to the government's changing priorities around so social policy children, families, and, um, and Fairer Scotland. So um, the first question is that um, if you go to the, um, the community's portfolio budget, um, you, and you see that um, the Fairer Scotland budget has been increased, I think it's fourfold from about seven million pounds to just shy of 28 million pounds. And at the same time, uh, the equalities budget has been increased by, I think it's 12% up to £22.7 million, and at the same time, <clears throat> there's an additional £24.5 million for the third sector. So those three lines of the budget put together amount to £75 million. H how do you ensure that that £75 million is spent effectively? What, what's that £75 million you know, tr tr trying to achieve? Why do we need to spend £75 million on those lines of the budget this year, whereas last year it was very significantly less than that? Okay. I'd make the point that um, the call on resources portfolios is something a matter of discussion, yes, at Cabinet, but between myself and Cabinet Secretaries. What they then determine as priorities uh, within that, they have some flexibility for. Um, so I would suggest in some of this, in assessing the uh, priorities within that portfolio, that uh, Angela Constance and Jean Freeman may be able to offer up more on why those areas are in the need that they believe uh, to be uh, uh, presented like that. Um, I would argue that clearly we've done a lot around equalities, inequality, uh, poverty, um, tackling of issues of a sensitive nature, whether it's um, sectarianism, um, uh, discrimination. So I think a lot of the work around that is involved in these uh, particular budget lines, but the Cabinet Secretary, in terms of the overall settlement that she has, views these as a, a priority um, uh, within that, and there has been uh, an increasing call upon those resources. If we take just, I think, part of the equalities line hasn't increased for a number of years, and the Cabinet Secretary has taken the view that um, it should be increased um, at this point in time. So that is more of a question to the Cabinet Secretary about priorities within that strategic spend. Um, but I think it shows that for the community's brief that they have sufficient resources uh, to um, deliver what they've pledged to deliver in terms of the programme for government commitments. The biggest single increase is in the um, Fairer Scotland uh, budget, which, as I say, is a fourfold. I mean, that's a very significant increase. It's a fourfold increase. And as I understand it, Cabinet Secretary, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, that's largely because of commitments that the Scottish Government is undertaking um, pursuant to the Child Poverty Scotland Act, which we passed uh, earlier on, um, or which we passed late last, late last year. But I noticed that in the 
education and skills portfolio, the budget for children and families is shrinking, um, and in particular, the budget for creating positive futures is shrinking by about a third, by some £30 million. So what I'm trying to understand is, you know, whether, whether if, when, when you look at all these numbers together, whether there really is a change in priorities and a change in spending commitments, or if money is just being taken out of one budget that relates to children and families, um, that happens to be in the education and skills portfolio, and put in another budget which relates to children and families, which belongs in the community's portfolio. I think uh, now you can hear me more clearly. I'm sure that the committee welcomes th uh, that. Um, I think, <laughs> I think uh, if I can use that as an example to um, engage with um, both committees, it may well have come up at the committee session with each cabinet secretary so that you can do the finance committee's job of a strategic overview of the budget, bring both together. Uh, but I would, rather than try and speak to another cabinet secretary's portfolio on the detail of their commitments, I would rather take that as an example, or take that as an example, and then bring together a strategic response about how the two relate. Which takes me to essentially the charge, which there's a, there's a bit of you know, cost shunting going on uh, within the system. That's not the case. Um, that overall, where there are changes to budget lines, it's because if either there's been a transfer of responsibility or um, there is no longer a requirement for a particular spend in a portfolio, then that line may change. But there's no sense, essentially, of a, any, a, any sense of a obfuscation on part of myself to, to make any savings. Uh, to prove the point, I'll write back to the committee on that example that's been given by Mr Tompkins, because, as I say, some of the portfolio spend will be determined by the portfolio itself and what it sees are its... Uh, pressures and priorities. Yes, there's an overview. Yes, there's a strategic approach. Yes, collectively, we deliver on priorities. Uh, but there is some flexibility for Cabinet Secretaries. As you can see through reading the uh, Cabinet Secretary um, engagement with parliamentary committees uh, engagement around what may be a priority for them and why they have arrived at the decisions that they have. But there's no sense of any a, any um, transferring of uh, lines to, to, to hide any sort of saving. So I'll try and make that point. That wasn't even the context that Adam Tompkins said, actually, because it was growth in budget lines that led to the inquiry. So I'm happy to clarify in writing. Is the, is the, is the, um, I mean, I'm, just, I'm surprised to see that the children and families line of the budget is shrinking, given that we know, for example, that the biggest single driver of homelessness in Scotland at the moment is family breakdown. Is, is, it, is it shrinking because you, you know you're not going to need to spend any money this year on, on the discredited named persons? No. Um, <clears throat> well, no, is, 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 that, is that why that budget's shrinking? No, it's not, is the straightforward answer to that question. If you take children and families, for example, if you want to talk about what is in the budget in relation to children uh, and families' uh, priorities, clearly there's work around attainment, there's work around mitigating uh, welfare uh, reform, there's the expanded baby box, there is more around family nurse uh, partnerships, there's enhancements. Uh, around social care provision as well. So in all of that, if you look at the totality of resource, it is absolutely, to go into the core of the question, matching the policy priority and delivering what we said we would in the programme for government. But where individual budget lines change, comprehensive budget lines of a substantial budget, then it may be just because of the nature of that budget line, but absolutely we're delivering more overall for um, children uh, and families. And uh, that's reflected through um, portfolio spend. Emma Harper has some, some questions in the area of qualities as well, I think. Emma? Thanks very much, Convener. Um, the Scottish Women's Budget Group provided us a briefing ahead, and uh, in reading the information, there's many positive points, and, and there's also some recommendations that they've made in the brief. And Adam Tompkins has touched, touched a little bit about homelessness, but I'm interested in the, the economy and uh, fair work pensions portfolio, there's an uplift of 64%, and the Scottish Women's Budget Group actually welcomed this new tax bans and protecting people on lower incomes. So in terms of spending in this portfolio, could you expand on where you would like to see the money spent from the uplift that you've put into this portfolio? In relation to economy? Yes. <clears throat> okay. I think... Um, 
It relates to some of my opening remarks about growing the economy and stimulating uh, the economy. And I, I think you've also tied the question into equalities uh, as well, which, which would make sense both on how we assess uh, tax policy and how we spend resources as well. You, you can make an assumption that um, expenditure uh, on enhanced uh, childcare only benefits women, it actually benefits women and men, but um, that would be good for getting more people into um, the labour market. That's not in this portfolio, but what is uh, in this portfolio will be increased uh, resource for um, as I say, uh, city deals, research and development, uh, business support, uh, employability uh, and training uh, as well. So uh, that will all have a focus on growing the economy but also supporting skills and uh, the uh, gender gap and the skills challenge um, as well uh, as, as a economic growth. I mean, one of the a substantial element, to be fair, of the uplift in the economy brief will be around the use of capital and financial transactions too, and that will be, for example, to support um, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, uh, the New South of Scotland uh, Agency, uh, preliminary work uh, uh, there, um, as well as capitalising the National Investment Bank. And I've touched upon uh, uh, R&D because we know that enhancing and improving productivity is important to the strength of the economy overall as well. So I think equality is tied into all of this. Uh, overall, growing the economy, having a fairer economy, allowing people access to opportunities to get into work if that's appropriate. Um, uh, for them and as you've touched upon the equalities group and I know I've had a further meeting uh, to have as well, appreciate it, spend and um, tax that's significant here and the income tax policy um, is uh, in being more progressive will benefit um, women Just as you bring up the, the South Scotland Enterprise Agency which has been developed which I welcome there's £10 million as an initial funding proposal for that. Is there any specific idea or detail come forward yet? That was also mentioned in this, um, the briefing from the Scottish Women's Budget Group, but they didn't specifically look at you know, equality type aspects of it. But I'm interested if there's any further detail about it. I don't, I don't have any more detail at this stage, but the Economy Secretary, who has lead responsibility here, um, I imagine, would. And essentially it's taken... Because let's not pretend that Scottish Enterprise didn't try and support the south of Scotland. It did. I mean, I visited projects supported by uh, Scottish Enterprise in the south of Scotland. But what the creation of the new agency will do is give a greater focus to that part of the country and this resource is to ensure that well, there was a concern, I suppose, that the new agency would just be created of extracting out of Scottish Enterprise that which was already going on in the south of Scotland. So this additional resource is to make the point that it's about additionality, not just replication of SE's work. Uh, the Economy Secretary could provide more on uh, a development of the agency if that's required by the committee. Okay. Can I ask one question about the homelessness issue? That there you go. Okay, um, Adam Tompkins uh, brought up briefly, briefly as well. There are specific different issues attached to women who are homeless, if they've especially got children, and this, the Scottish Women's Budget Review alluded to that. Is there any additional information that you would be considering or looking at their review to maybe alter any budget uh, uh, I guess spending that would be tailored more towards homeless women? Again, um, convener, I have to be very careful then going beyond my function and role as finance secretary. Um, individual portfolio cabinet secretaries can say more about some of the detail behind proposed spend. It's for me to make sure that the necessary resources are available, and that's why we've increased both resources specifically for um, a poverty and separately for a homelessness. And that's the first £10 million pounds of the £50 million pounds Ending Homelessness Together Action Fund. The uh, uh, accountable lines for that then go to the uh, portfolio brief, which is communities. Okay, thank you. Thank Ms. Patrick, do you have some supplementary on this? <clears throat> Briefly, a, a supplementary on the, the evidence from the Scottish Women's Budget Group. I, I think if we're, if we're going to acknowledge that evidence, we should acknowledge the, the serious criticisms that it does 
contain. Uh, not so much about one year's budget, but about how we do budgets, how government does budgets and how parliament scrutinizes budgets. Uh, the, the evidence uh, that's been submitted, that the submission uh, says that like previous budgets, uh, this one lacks gender competence. They give specific uh, examples in relation uh, to social care as an investment in the economy uh, and also to the way in which um, the, the phrase economically inactive uh, fails to recognise the economic value of unpaid work, the, the bulk of which is done by women. So we're not going to fix this overnight in a single budget, but does the government recognise that there's a lot more progress that needs to happen uh, in terms of gender analysis in the construction of budgets as well as our responsibility as Parliament in the scrutiny of budgets. Uh, does the government recognise there's a lot more progress that needs to happen there? Yes. I can go on at length, but I'm happy to concede the point. Yes, I think we can do further work here, yeah. Well, I, I hope we can hear some, some further output in, in what's going to happen differently in the future. That's, that's helpful to get some, some clear honesty there. Thank you. OK, we're, we're going to move into areas to do with capital and the economy now. And Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. You've said in the past, Cabinet Secretary, that this is a budget to help uh, the economy. And in uh, some of the discussions we had Earlier this morning with uh, sectoral representatives from the North East, they were making the point to us that uh, spending on connectivity is important to uh, help uh, economic development in this part of the world. Uh, looking at the, the spending plans uh, on uh, connectivity in Table 12.1, what that shows is that spending on motorways and trunk roads is being cut from uh, this year to next by £136 million. And spending on digital connectivity has been cut by 76 million. So that's an aggregate cut of 212 million pounds in areas which businesses are telling us would help grow the economy. So how does that help economic growth in the northeast and other parts of the country when you're making such large cuts in these areas? It's not necessarily a cut because the nature of capital spending is you spend resources on a project until it's complete and substantial parts of the A9, or if you take the Queen's Ferry Crossing, uh, or other roads projects, once they're complete, you no longer have to pay for their construction. So I think the nature of that is the completion of a number of projects that then leads to, yes, a pipeline of future projects, um, but overall, um, it's the nature of projects which are you know, very warmly welcomed, but ultimately being complete has a different um, profile of spend. AWPR is another example that um, you don't necessarily just fund the budget line to the same extent on capital. Capital is delivered by the projects, and the projects are largely complete. Digital is another example, I suppose, where you could point to the current digital regime uh, coming to an end, but in preparation for the £600 million investment in reaching 100, which is taking super-fast broadband to every part of Scotland. And that £600 million spend is profiled to start not in the next financial year, because procurement to this takes about a year, I'm advised, although that's, um, the, the advertising for that procurement is in the public domain. It starts in a future year. So if you take digital, there's a point where expenditure goes down, but is then ramped up again significantly as the project uh, takes shape. So it's not necessarily uh, because of fluctuations in expenditure doesn't suggest that it's not a, commi a commitment or a priority. It's just the nature of spending on capital projects. Okay, th th thanks for that. I mean, just, just on the digital, I, mean, I hear the, the, the point that, that you're making in response, but you know, be aware of the... the, the focus there's been on this issue of digital connectivity within Parliament um, over the past few months in particular, and yet the reduction in the digital spend is, is more than 50% from this year to the next. Now, you know, would, would there not be an argument for starting the next uh, uh, scale of project sooner rather than seeing this big drop-off in the capital spend on digital for next year? I make the point again that um, this is the nature of procurement of such large infrastructure projects. Uh, some of the procurement, I mean, let's put aside the political argument about whose responsibility it is. Of course, we all know it's a, resort, a reserved uh, function. Um, there's no point having that debate. The Scottish Government's getting on with delivering a quality of digital connection that's far superior to that which will exist south of the border. Uh, 30 megabits is not uh, much slower 
10, and we're taking it to every part of the country as well. But to be able to procure the um, job to do that is a massive exercise. I'm advised to say, you know, even if it goes quickly as we want, it will take a year. And uh, Fergus Ewing leads on this, but has been working tirelessly to try and get clarity from the UK government around their procurement intentions. Why is that important? Because it's important to understand what UK government was going to do at a UK level and how they would be procuring digital from one of the very few suppliers that can do it at scale. So it's terribly complex. Uh, but the explanation I give is that as our um, uh, digital schemes uh, come to an end that were planned for, the superior commitment to take it unparalleled right across Scotland will require full and proper procurement in a professional way. Murdo Fraser would expect no less, and that takes time, and that's why the profiling of spend is as it is. Okay, thank you. Oh, can I ask a related question, uh, Adam Kavina? Um, I'm wondering how much flexibility there is in the budget. At this point in the process last year, you'd, you'd come to Parliament and presented your draft budget. And by the time we got to the stage one debate um, at the beginning of February, you'd found an extra £191 million from the uh, budget exchange mechanism, as you called it, or, or down the back of the sofa, as I think some of the others uh, characterised it as. Uh, what's down the back of your sofa this year? <laughs> For the committee, as I'm, I'm moving house, so I don't have the requirement at the same sofa. So, if anyone on the committee requires a three piece, <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, the, uh, the, the issue last year related around flexibility there was non domestic rates. Non domestic rates, um, I, I've, I've read the Audit Scotland report, but you know, the plan is to get that back uh, into balance. So that was one area of flexibility. The other was around uh, budget exchange, which I've set out helpfully in a, in a precedent um, at table one uh, in the uh, budget doc document. I think I touched on this last week on page 184. Um, covers the additional um, uh, resource that's going into the budget. Now you'll see on the line budget exchange reserve for 2017-18 it was £203 million. For 2018-19 it's proposed to be £158 million. Uh, for example, that was the other area of, of flexibility. Frankly, finance secretaries in the past may have been able to hold on to that for uh, financial management reasons or anything else. Uh, I up front um, uh, used it uh, for uh, the purposes of those uh, uh, budget negotiations. The reason that figure is at uh, that is, frankly, there is very tight financial management, and that is what is felt by officials um, is most appropriate at that time. But that figure, of course, remains under review because we are not at the end of this uh, financial year. So hopefully that answers the question, because that was the two key issues, and the third was, of course, the change in a tax policy, which generated a sum which then contributed to ultimately to the final position of the budget. So, so when you come to present your stage one uh, of the budget bill to Parliament in a few weeks' time, are we expecting there will be any dramatic changes to the size of the budget, or are you telling us that this is it? Uh, convener, all I can say, if Murdo Fraser is in the chamber, there is always drama uh, in, the, in the chamber. Um, I, I, I'll be blunt here. I continue to have an open door uh, with opposition parties. I clearly can't get a budget through uh, Parliament unless there is an abstention or a proactive vote for the budget. I continue to negotiate with any willing partner, including Murdo Fraser. Um, Fair offer, Cabinet Secretary. Of course, it would help all potential negotiating partners if they knew how much money you had in your back pocket. Well, let me say that um, the, I, for the reasons I have pointed out, I think I fairly said the difference in non-domestic rates flexibility. There is a clear plan to bring that into balance, and that is why that position is as it is. And on a budget exchange, that is the current assessment of a, what is reasonable to contribute to the budget. And so, what is the other lever available to parties? Well, uh, change in tax policy. Or if any party thinks I've made the wrong uh, priorities in terms of expenditure, there may be shuffling of numbers there. So it's not for me to um, uh, tell opposition parties how to bring alternative proposals uh, to me. Uh, but the budget that I've presented, in a perfect world, is the budget that I would like to go through at stage one, two and three. But I'm a realist. I have to engage with other political parties. I'm not sure the, I'm not sure the finance committee is the place that one 
to see a negotiation <laughs> begin between the Scottish Government and the Conservative Party, I think, which, which would surprise everybody. But that seemed like the beginning of a, a real opportunity there. Um, but listen, before I go on to Ash Denham, the, the whole issue, the NDRI issue was really, which Murdo was raising, James Kelly had questions in that area. So let's just deal with that now, because it's a supplementary to what has been dealt with, and I'll come oh, to Ash. OK, thanks, convener. Um, you said in your opening statement, Cabinet Secretary, or, or in response to the convener's uh, summary of the morning sessions, that uh, non -domestic, all non-domestic rate income uh, was retained you know, locally by local councils. Um, but in actual fact, that's not the case for, for this year. Uh, if you look at Table 10.18 uh, in your own document, uh, non-domestic rate income is 2.812 million and dis distribu the, the, the distribution of that is 2.636 million. So there's actually 176 million a gap, 176 million less has been distributed than has been taken in. Do you want to explain that? Yes, I can explain it by pointing out that non-domestic rates essentially is multi-year budgeting. Some years it's raised more than is, is distributed in uh, a, and that accounts for that. There is a, a balance to be cleared, but ultimately it was all given to local government. That continues to be the case. But what, what in effect that means in this year, that what has been uh, forecasted to be collected by local government uh, is not all going to be distributed. £176 million pounds is going to be retained. Nothing, nothing's retained. I mean, it's in the pool, which meant that there were some years when local government benefited from the fact that, um, I mean, essentially, I can assure Mr. Kelly that the resources are guaranteed. What's set out in the local government figure, that's what local governments get, irrespective of what's uh, collected through non-domestic rates. Uh, but some years, uh, more was distributed than was collected. And so, um, what we're doing is ensuring that the pool is in balance, i.e. back at zero. So yes, for some years, less will be distributed than is accrued, but that makes up for the converse in other years. I recognise the points you're making. However, uh, the point I'm making is that if all the money that was collected in relation to non-domestic rate income was distributed, then uh, local government would have £176 million pounds more, and that would solve perhaps some of the issues that committee members have raised. That, as a proposition, may well be correct and true. It wouldn't keep Audit Scotland happy if there was a negative balance, uh, I have to say, uh, on that. I don't think it would keep the Finance Committee happy if I wasn't addressing that balance and had no plans to address that uh, a, a balance. But, but that could be a choice. But the Essentially, the, the desire is always to try and get distribution as close to forecast as possible, and where it's in deficit is to uh, address that. That's what Audit Scotland have asked me to do. It, my plan to do it is through the budget. This is perfectly normal practice. This is what happens to get the, uh, uh, the account back into balance, and it's fiscally responsible, and it will be achieved according to my plans in the course of the next financial year. Okay, so but, but, but it is a policy choice. If you choose not to do it, there are consequences. Just one final question, just to be clear. The figures in the, the budget currently are £2.812 million in terms of what uh, is forecast to be collected and £2.636 million in terms of distribution. Are those figures your final figures in this or are there going to be any amendments to them? No, they'll be our final figures. That's our forecast, yes. It, what, what has happened in the pre, kind of previous cycles is there be maybe massive changes because of appeals information coming in. Um, but I think uh, I'm looking at Gray and Olinson here. Those, those forecasts are as robust as they can be. And what's more have been uh, overseen by SFC. Yep, so yep. from 2018-19, those are Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts. And just to add what the Cabinet Secretary said previously, it's prior year adjustments. So taking a number of years, all of the income go uh, non-domestic rates income goes back to local government. The legislation indicates that non-domestic rates income can only go to support local government spending. But, but again, it is true to say if you choose not to address the deficit, that is a choice, but it will fly in the face of what Audit Scotland and other audit agencies would expect of us. To issues regarding the economy, Ash. Good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, the draft budget includes a 64% increase for the economy, jobs and fair work budget, which presumably um, covers a number of interventions that you've um, taken to support the economy. Um, in response to a question by Emma Harper earlier, you mentioned um, a couple of interventions, um, funding for research and development and also capitalisation of the Scottish Investment Bank. Are there other interventions also that are covered under that 64% increase? If everything that's in that portfolio chapter should be uh, covered in that 64%, uh, I think there's actually a factual correction in the document where there's a lower percentage somewhere in the, in the document, but the actual figure is 64% uh, increase in that portfolio um, covered, I think, quite substantially uh, in uh, the chapter. Um, but the... Um, Economy Secretary, of course, will return with greater detail on how some of that's laid out, because some of its future investment plans, uh, we've, we've spoken about the Barnett consequentials, but capital and financial, tra financial transactions over a number of years. So some of the detail, for example, around what the capitalisation of the Scottish National Investment Bank will look like is yet to be uh, determined, because we're still finalising the remit, because we're consulting on that. But there's a lot of investment that will absolutely throw from these uh, decisions. Uh, those for 18, 19 around research and uh, development, because we know productivity is an issue, or actual investment in, in infrastructure is all um, significant. Uh, housing isn't mentioned in this portfolio. That would be elsewhere. That would be in the community's portfolio. But, of course, it will be a matter of fact that investment over £700 million in housing is good for construction, good for skills, good for apprenticeships. And then good for those folk who will be living in the um, quality, uh, affordable housing um, as well. So right through the, the draft budget document, there are interventions that help grow our economy uh, and tackle some of the issues that we know um, we face. But that increase covers largely the uh, capital and financial transactions uh, uplift with some specific resource um, investment as well. And the enterprise agencies uh, uh, continue to deliver a key function around uh, some of that. Is that of assistance? It is. Um, you mentioned there the Scottish Investment Bank and the draft budget is proposing to capitalise this with £340 million of investment. I think that's a really interesting development, this idea of a new scheme um, with a view to providing long-term patient capital. Um, in this morning's workshops, um, that was regarded as quite a positive step by the Scottish Government, but some of the participants were, um, I suppose, they were unsure of how this was going to work, you know, moving forward. And they were looking for assurances, you know, that this will lead to better investment decisions. Would you be able to explain a little bit more around how you think this particular funding will achieve more for the Scottish economy? The Economy Secretary would lead on that. I've certainly been involved in some of the discuss discussions with uh, Benny Higgins uh, on its formation. So we're still at the stage, yes, we've made a financial commitment. Uh, the investment bank will receive uh, these resources. Argu arguably, it could receive uh, more depending on how we want to, this to look. And that's why we're engaging on the structures, what works uh, best in getting as much leverage in of... Um, the public investment, the financial transactions and that kind of capital. And you know, there might be exploration as well around pension funds and others who might want to contribute to it because there's, there's a great deal of um, potential in this being a success if it reaches a critical mass and that will lead to more people buying into investing in Scotland and investing in infrastructure. But what we want to try and achieve out of it as well is just multiplying the benefits, a positive domino effect. So by making that commitment, it shows we're serious about the uh, investment bank. Um, and I think it will support, it has the potential to support both uh, the private sector um, growth, uh, but also, and crucially, public sector infrastructure because of the long-term nature of it. Um, but so it's still at a, an early stage in that we're engaging and consulting on the structure of the bank, uh, but that um, resource that's allocated of £340 million pounds is from 2019 uh, onwards. That's a two-year figure. And, of course, we'll look to try and supplement that. The other element of that is before we get to that, there's the Building Scotland Fund, uh, which is uh, a precursor to the bank, and that resource can be achieved in 1819. And, again, the Cabinet Secretary will consider, uh, Keith Brown will consider um, the best way to compose and structure that. Thank you. Alexander, I think you had some questions in this area as well. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned financial transactions earlier. 
Uh, and the draft budget includes 489 million uh, in 2018-19 for financial transactions. Um, now the financial transaction money is interest free uh, and the amounts to be repaid uh, are not adjusted for inflation uh, and the money can be repaid uh, over 25, you know, up to 25 years uh, depending on the projects. Um, so can the Cabinet Secretary just confirm you know, what real terms value, that the real terms value of financial transaction monies to be repaid by the Scottish Government uh, to the Treasury uh, might be significantly below the original amount granted? Um, no, the financial transactions line has increased in terms of what UK Government was proposing to give to us. I'm, you know, I welcome that. So, questions, the monies to be repaid yes. will be less in real terms. Uh, going by, well, dep it depends what we spend them on, but on the basis of what you've just described, um, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, and so can I just ask, what assessment uh, does the Cabinet Secretary put forward as to what that profile uh, will be? Well, discussions with Cabinet Secretaries in terms of what their requests are for the spend in financial transactions or discussions with the Treasury on... Discussions with the Treasury uh, over the repayment schedule. OK. I'll ask uh, John to cover the technical issue of uh, discussions with Treasury <coughs> on that. I, I, I want to be absolutely clear that um, the financial transactions increased, you know, arguably did come as something as a surprise because in engagement with UK government ministers, they gave no hint that there would be an increase. What I've welcomed is um, the potential to have budget exchange carryover because the sums are such that to be able to spend, you want to plan properly, you want to ensure that they're invested correctly uh, as well. So I want to be assured that there'll be the ability to um, have budget ex exchange, especially for this financial year, because it's come so late in the day um, that you'd want to be assured that you can carry it into the next financial year. So my engagement with ministers was no pre-warning that it was coming. I get the courtesy call, the, frankly, the night before the budget to say what the headline figure is going to be. And uh, I, I don't get any detail beyond that. Well, that's up to UK government. I think there's a better way of doing business with us uh, to conduct our affairs and give me a bit better notice. Now, but anyway, it is what it is. And um, from that financial transactions figure, we've then worked through both the allocations for the draft budget, but officials engage uh, on the detail. Um, the only conversation I've had in the past was around the extent of financial transactions, whether we could have budget exchange because of the nature of them. As Mr Burnett has described, uh, it's, it's good to have flexibility from one year into the next and the level at which we can have budget exchange. In terms of the repayment terms and so on, if John, you could cover that? Yeah. I mean, okay. Um, I mean, just to say that we are still in discussion with the Treasury over, as Mr. Mackay says, we've you know received um, significantly more financial transactions than we expected to have available, um, and discussions on the, the profile of those and when they'll be used and, and, and ultimately when they'll be repaid is still is still under active discussion. So the answer to your ultimate question will it will require us to conclude that that discussion with the Treasury um, on when we expect the, the FTs to be used and ultimately when we expect them to be yeah. repaid. Yeah. I mean, this is a hypothetical example. I think Spice calculated for us that yeah, 80 million of uh, financial transaction money uh, repaid over 20 years uh, with inflation at 3% would be equivalent to a repayment of 44 million. I'm just wondering what kind of assessment has been done or will be done and what will we see in terms of the 489 million? Can you just ask what we've been asked to assess exactly? Is it a repayment figure? Is it the yes. value of yes. the, Is it essentially... A, a repayment figure, yeah. Okay. Scott? Right. It, it's just to say that, that that is obviously ultimately dependent on how those um, financial transactions are ultimately utilised in terms of the repayment on individual programmes. So it may be that the repayments on an individual programme are not directly linked to an even um, profile, so it may be a, a, a repayment in full at the end, in which case the real terms, the, the, the real terms calculation, you know, the, there'll, be, there'll be quite a variety. The point I'm trying to make, quite a variety. It's not as, it's not as straightforward as a, as a um, straight line analysis, and it's ultimately dependent on finalising those programmes, which hasn't been done yet. So. Just to be clear, is it, is it dependent on the programmes? From what I understand from the briefing, that the repayment schedule 
uh, is agreed with the Treasury and is based on the anticipated profile of Scottish Government receipts. Yeah, so it's, so it's linked to, to once we've finalised the, the, the profile of the investments that we're making with that, then there's, there's an annual return that we do to HM Treasury and we've, we have finalised that profile on an annual basis. Okay, and so then the difference between the choice of programmes you could invest in or, or fund will have, a different, will have different profiles? Yeah. Indeed. And will we be presented with assessments of those? Uh, TB. Is, is that the question? Is Does finance? that become public? Well, I don't think it's, it's, there's any sensitivity about that. You know, I mean, yeah. if the you know, Finance Committee wants more of this, I can happily give more. I can see the appetite of the other committee members for it. So you know, if you want it, you can have it. I'm just wondering if there's a d difference in decisions of whether you're investing in programmes which have a short-term repayment or, or you choose to invest in a, or fund a programme with a longer repayment profile because at the end of the day, the final sum to be repaid will be less in real terms. It's actually less of that and more of the value of the programmes in themselves. So when you have the availability of financial transactions, uh, the internal process, frankly, is to engage with um, Cabinet Secretary and say what is the demand, what is the need, what is the potential use of financial transaction, and then I have ultimate responsibility in determining how that's distributed. Um, but from a policy point of view, it's what will add greatest value to the economy. Um, because of the um, restrictions uh, on it, um, not every portfolio can make use of them. So in um, uh, the community is brief. Um, uh, you can't use them to pay welfare benefits, but you can use them for a help to buy housing scheme, for example. Um, so portfolios suggest their potential uh, use, and clearly economy is suggesting that using it to help capitalise the National Investment Bank's pretty substantial use of it in future years. Um, so it's more judged by the contribution to um, our objectives and the economy and if you then uh, wish further information on the analysis of the repayment profile, we can provide that to the uh, committee. Thank you very much, Camille. Yeah. Ivan, I'll come back to you in regard to the national performance framework issues, which you didn't get a chance to ask earlier. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, um, the, the, the area I want to touch on is uh, we've obviously talked a lot about inputs, how much you're spending in different um, different areas of the, uh, of the budget. Um, but clearly, at the end of the day, what really matters is um, the out, uh, outputs and the outcomes from, uh, from the various portfolio departments. Um, now, clearly, we've got in place the National Performance Framework, which measures or attempts to measure what the government is delivering um, as a consequence of the, the, the money that the budget is spending. Um, now, there's been some comments from the, the Budget Process Review Group which I thought recognises that we've got that framework in place. Um, there's perhaps um, more work to be done in terms of uh, clearly laying out what the outcomes we're trying to achieve with the budget spend in each particular area and how you track that, what milestones you've got in place and, and how we move, we move towards that. Um, and certainly from my own looking at this and in, in particular areas, um, there's perhaps more... Um, the link between what we're measuring, what money we're putting into the budget, um, what that money is supposed to achieve, how we're measuring whether we're achieving that or not, is perhaps not maybe as robust yet as it, as it could be. So I'd just like your reflections on that. Is the, do you see there's more work to be done um, around about the National Performance Framework and how that links to budget spend lines and what direction do you see that going in? Of course, there's work underway at the moment because we're looking in a cross party and there's a great deal of public sector and civic Scotland engagement as well uh, on um, Scotland Performs uh, and the uh, indicators that we work to so is there work going on? Yes there is we're looking at aligning that with where we are right now it was due for a refresh and that's happening in terms of how it relates to the budget, I mean, all politicians that I've ever heard in the Scottish Parliament say we're really focused on outcomes, not necessarily inputs. And then we go to the chamber and we have a rammy about teacher numbers, number of nurses, number of this, and the number of police numbers. Fine. Hey, that's politics. But it's a wee bit less focused on outcomes say, than, uh, than you would uh, expect from uh, uh, all politicians, I suppose. Uh, to be fair. Um, uh, do we look at the Scotland Performs uh, regime? Yes, we do. Uh, so it sets out the broad ambitions uh, for our country, the themes within that, and then the indicators, and it says, you know, where's more work required 
because it's got an amber, it's got a kind of traffic light system um, and where progress has been made and where progress has not been made. And yes, uh, ministers and certainly officials as well uh, look at that in determining uh, decisions. Um, there is not an absolutely true relationship between um, figures necessarily of performance and spend because there is also the matter of political um, choice uh, as well. Someone could say, well, you've got crime at a 41-year, 43-year low, and uh, you're meeting all your targets there. Therefore, you should spend less money there and more money elsewhere. Well, that's not the choices politicians make. Um, so I make the point that, yes, we look at it. Yes, it guides much of our thinking, uh, but it's not formulaic in the sense that it then leads to automatic spending decisions. And uh, it's under review. It's under live review right now in a cross-party and cross-sector way. It's good to hear that, and, and hopefully in future we'll be able to have spend more time talking about what's been delivered rather than, as you say, just um, knocking back and forward um, numbers about what's, uh, what's been spent. Okay, thank you. I think you'd, you'd issues to do with the general structure of the budget as well in the future around preventative spend and three-year budgets. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, on behalf of some of our contributors this morning, Cabinet Secretary, uh, Aberdeen Councillor, voluntary organisations and others, they were asking about the, the, how the budget works and whether there's potential for it to move to multi-year budgeting. And you mentioned that yourself in relation to the non-domestic rates issue that was mentioned earlier. They, of course, feel that that gives more stability to the various sectors, not, not just the voluntary sectors, but others too. And it also has an impact on the opportunities they can provide for training and skills development. If it's over a year, it's much more harder to deliver that. What are your flexibilities and, and constraints probably as well? and moving the whole Scottish budget scenario to that kind of level where it's perhaps on a multi-year basis and what the advantages might be for something like that? I, I recognise the, the uh, concern and the criticism. It would be better for, for everyone in the you know, public sector, frankly, if they're able to plan on a multi-year basis. I totally understand that, but me included. Um, you know, 60% you know, of, 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 of revenue decisions are in the hands of the UK government and Scotland not... No, and the Scottish Government, therefore, and we are all subject to any economic shock. So without that absolute certainty in the resource that I will have available uh, to propose to Parliament, without that certainty, I'm in the kind of challenged position as well. And if you take the, issue, um, the issues this year, I mean, the budget variance could have been hundreds of millions of pounds, negatively or positively. So it's just that... that um, it's that, that variance and uncertainty that gives me the challenge as well. Would I like to have multi-year budgeting? Yes. Do I see the value in it for all those involved? Yes, I do. It, but it's not true to say that everything's only a one-year determination. I mean, for that matter, as a minority government, I would love for an opposition party to say, I'll not just vote for your budget this year, but for every year for the rest of your term. That sounds pretty good to me, I have to say. And that will give us certainty. But in truth... In truth, we couldn't lock down every figure because of the determinants not in our control. Having said all of that, um, there is a multi-year settlement for some areas where I've been able to do it. For example, housing. Because I recognise you can't build the houses. You can't have the certainty if you don't give a multi-year settlement for housing. Uh, Childcare delivery will also be a multi-year settlement. Not this year, because we're still discussing uh, with the local government uh, the figures that we can agree on. But the intention is to have a multi-year settlement. Uh, Recognising the pressure, no doubt, we all uh, heard and felt from culture. Uh, they are suffering from a downward um, a trajectory on uh, a lottery um, income. Uh, so I have made a commitment to, to try and make up the loss in, in lottery. So I've, I've tried to be helpful in a number of areas without locking down every figure that's so inflexible that the budget has no room for manoeuvre. Um, but I totally understand and appreciate the desire for multi-year budgeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, I think we now move into public sector pay. James, I think you had something, so did Patrick. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks a lot, convener. Uh, you, you outlined the, the, the pay policy at the start, Cabinet Secretary. Can you tell us how much has been included in the budget to cover the cost of that? The... Pay policy is traditionally dealt with as part of the overall settlement um, within a portfolio spend, so there isn't normally a set-aside resource for pay policy. Um, 
the pay policy that's been arrived at is deemed to be affordable by those portfolios. So I don't have a separate allocation for pay policy. It's all part of the budget settlement. So when you worked out the, the pay policy, you didn't work out costs linked to that? I could give uh, the member uh, the cost of, say, no change, no change this year to the pay policy that I propose, if that's of assistance. But what I'm saying is not a separate bit in the budget for that. And that, um, I'll just get the um, specific figure if that's of assistance to the committee. And this is from no change to the policy that we um, propose. Okay, so it would be 138 million. So the policy of 3%, 2%, as understood, is 138 million pounds is, a, is a, the figure for those under our pay policy, which is those um, uh, public bodies and Scottish government staff. Clearly, pay policy becomes the benchmark for others, uh, which we don't um, necessarily um, direct, but it becomes the, the benchmark. So it's important to make that point. That might be a question mark why that figure isn't as high as maybe you had um, assumed. But that's just for those under our direct pay policy. Yeah, I understand the, the different responsibilities, but if we take local government as a, an example, and I know that you're not directly responsible for pay policy in local, local government. However, um, if you take the, the funding of that, you know, previously we were operating under a 1%, a there the, the, the were 1% settlements. And in order to, we've had a table from SPICE that estimates if you include uh, local government employees, including police officers and firefighters, uh, etc., the additional cost uh, of the moving to the, the pay policy that you, you outlined um, would be uh, an additional £90 million pounds in terms of the local government settlement. Now, was that taken account of in terms of when you were calculating the local government settlement? Um, yes, the uh, local government certainly raised that over the course of the uh, negotiations. Uh, and I'm always, I mean, I'll answer any committee, uh, any question that committee may want to ask me, but sometimes it's unfair to um, uh, to quote others, but certainly the, the question from local government was be mindful of public sector pay policy when I'm determining Scottish government pay policy, uh, and as well as uh, uh, the financial settlement. Additional £90 million pounds that's required for the uplift is included in the local government settlement? I'm, I, I'm certainly not making I'm, what I'm, I'm not, I don't set out a specific allocation for local government pay as part of the settlement. Uh, with the exception of teachers, that was specific because the Scottish Government is involved in the tripartite negotiations there and it helped ensure that there was a deal uh, to, to continue the delivery of education and resolve that particular dispute. So I wouldn't ordinarily set out an allocation for pay within the local government settlement. Um, and I have seen a, some commentary uh, from one leader a, to suggest that they believe that that can a, deliver that if they want to go embark in a 3% pay policy to uh, deliver that. That is a matter for each leader and it's a matter for local government. Certainly not for me to direct their pay policy. Is it, final point, Convener. Is it, is it not the case then that you've set out a, a pay policy but you haven't funded it? I've set out a pay policy for um, Scottish Government and it becomes the benchmark for the NHS and I've made uh, very clear uh, uh, commitments around the NHS. I don't set out pay policy for local government um, and I think the settlement that they have is for them to negotiate with the trade unions what their settlement should look like going forward. Uh, the pay increase should look like going forward. Since the government uh, confirmed some months ago that it would lift the 1% pay cap, there have been a number of different forms of words used to describe exactly what the government intended to do uh, before the, in the run-up to the publication of the draft budget. Uh, I think your parliamentary liaison officer uh, spoke on national television saying that the, the pay settlement should be at least inflation. 
Uh, I think the form of words that you and the First Minister have both used in the, in the Holyrood Chamber is uh, a pay settlement that takes account of the rising cost of living or takes account of inflation. Would you acknowledge that that hasn't been achieved in the pay policy that you published alongside the draft budget and that everybody in the public sector under that pay policy, including those directly affected, would continue to see real terms cuts in their pay? No, I believe it, it has achieved what I set out to achieve, which was to, and it's good to hear I was aligned with the First Minister's um, a position a, on it, which was really taking account of um, inflation, a, affordability a, overall, and absolutely lifting the pay cap. I do believe that's what I have delivered. Infl I, I have set out a, a progressive pay policy, just as we have a progressive tax policy, and we have made a decision to have a 3 per cent increase for those up to 30,000 and a 2 per cent increase for those above, uh, to retain the position uh, on supported uh, measures for low pay, uh, a position around no compulsory redundancies and a position around capping increases for the top as well. That is in accordance with lifting the pay cap and having a more progressive pay policy. You, you would accept, though, just on a, on a matter of fact, that 3 per cent is below inflation and therefore a real terms cut? It's below the current rate of CPI as last I saw the figure at 3.1 per cent which is expected to come into line at 3 per cent again. The forecast suggests it will be back at 3 per cent and if it does that then the uh, award up to £30,000 matches uh, inflation which achieves what I said it would which is lifting the pay cap. And on that £30,000 cut off between the, the 3 per cent and 2 per cent rates uh, you mentioned that the Scottish Government does have a role in, in relation to negotiation with teachers. Now, obviously, that's a process that's ongoing, and we don't know what the, the result will be. But do you anticipate that, that point of principle on a £30,000 uh, cut-off point being acceptable to teachers? And is it consistent with the Government's uh, emphasis on needing to address the problems in re teacher recruitment and retention? I make the other point that there is a further um, support, in addition to the base policy, around uh, progression as well. Uh, do I uh, think that the current proposition satisfies the ES, the IS, the representative body of teachers? No, it appears that from their public commentary it does not, to answer it honestly. And why it wouldn't? I can certainly understand for those in the public sector that are working in our public services that have had years of pay restraint why they might want more. Yes, of course I can understand that. Um, the government intend to respond to their call for, uh, not in necessarily in a single year, but a restoration in the value of their pay. I'm not sure, so, I'm not sure the government secretary can negotiate a pay deal here with the EIS in front of the cabinet, in front of the finance committee. I would simply make the point that the years of pay restraint helped ensure that we didn't have compulsory redundancies, that in having pay restraint um, we still had a clear divergence from UK government policy around no compulsory redundancies, measures to tackle low pay, we were more progressive and we still allowed progression when the UK government didn't. And in having the pay policy that we did, we were able to retain staff numbers far more than in the public sector than was the case south of the border and might otherwise have been the case in Scotland. As to the point about the commitment, I believe we have delivered. We've made an enhanced um, pay policy compared to what's been in place in, in previous years and I've given a you know, I've tried to quantify that for the interests of the committee. And as to the longer term direction of travel, yes, we would want to repair um, some of that inflationary impact on the take home pay uh, of staff categories. That is a direction of travel we would wish to take, but in any event, we have to do it within the realms of um, uh, affordability. And I think this year's departure from previous policy should be a welcome one. Capital as well, I, I did have one, one specific question on, on capital that, uh, that I didn't get in earlier. Um, uh, obviously, there was some discussion earlier about the financial transactions, and there's, uh, I don't think any of us would expect that you can answer to a, a level of detail exactly what all of that is going to be used for just yet. But there is a substantial capital budget in the, current, in, in the draft budget for the, the coming financial year. Um, there's a, a lack of specific information about the projects that that covers. 
Uh, and in particular, I'm interested in the carbon governance, the climate governance of, of the, the capital pipeline. Uh, the Scottish Government's aware of the call from the Low Carbon Infrastructure Task Force for the, the need for 70% uh, of capital spending or, or infrastructure spending to be on low carbon. We're substantially below that figure at the moment in Scotland. Can you tell us what the proposals in, on capital spending in the draft budget do to the figure on low carbon <laughs> infrastructure? Are we going up? Are we going down? What are we at? And uh, at what level of detailed information is publicly available uh, on the, the capital pipeline uh, as it stands at the moment? Okay. I there's something like six monthly reporting to the Public Audit Committee. Public Audit Committee received the information in terms of that auditing of, of those plans. There's the infrastructure investment plan uh, that is periodically uh, updated and that outlines the overall investment plans uh, of the government. Of course, what, the, what this budget is, is asking approval for is one year's um, investment around the capital plan. Uh, and the expenditure uh, therein. As to the question on uh, sustainability, you know, on, on something like active travel, uh, will double the figure from £40 million pounds to £80 million, pounds, that's specifically for, for, for active uh, travel. Uh, overall, on, on low carbon, I want further analysis uh, done on this, um, uh, but I believe that this budget would represent more on the transition to a low carbon economy, whether that's on uh, transport such as uh, rail, where the committee will be aware there's very specific issues around uh, rail uh, funding for the next uh, control period, uh, which is 2019 uh, onwards. Um, but I would believe that overall um, the, the, there's a greater contribution to the to the journey, pardon the pun, on uh, low carbon. I'm happy to share more of that with the committee um, as, it's, uh, as it's developed up. Are you specifically saying that the, the draft budget for 2018-19 increases the proportion of the capital spend that is on low carbon, and if so, to what? Well, I believe it does, and I'm happy to provide further information to the committee if you want me to analyse that in a fashion that we can agree. I, I mean, the, the, budget, the budget, of course, um, has uh, its own environmental impact assessment, but that's really just in the procurement of goods in that particular year as a consequence of the budget position. The carbon assessment of the budget doesn't go into any detail on, on the, the capital side, on the, what, what are the projects that are being funded yeah. uh, under the capital budget for the coming financial year, and what are the carbon implications of that? Okay. So, so that's a matter I'm happy to engage with the committee on and provide further information. What I was pointing out is the accountability of spending infrastructure is reported to another committee, but um, to give the committee satisfaction around uh, the carbon assessment, I would do further work and present that to the committee. Okay. I think there are a couple of areas Cabinet Secretary committed today to write to us further, further in writing to the issues raised by Adam Tompkins earlier in the committee's proceedings and obviously just now with Patrick Harvey. Uh, I think it just remains me now to thank, the, first of all, those members of the public, um, members of business community and organisations who came along to our workshop sessions this morning. It is a very valuable piece of work to thank members um, for their contributions throughout the day, to thank the Cabinet Secretary for his attendance at the, here in Aberdeen today, to thank the City Council for allowing us the use of their magnificent building here. Uh, I, just, I, I don't know if anyone saw the remarkably imposing picture of Henry Ray, who was a provost here between 1984 and 1988, who must have occupied the seat, I'm no doubt, at some stage. It was an imposing, rather magnificent picture. I just hope I, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't needing to be as formid formidable as obviously he was from his <laughs> picture. And with that, I close the proceedings of the committee. Thank you very much.